Hello, hello. Welcome to 21 Soul, everybody. We are here at the Rope It Ope Room uh, with uh, Mr. Adam Ahuja. Adam, you, how Mr. are Marks. you? Yeah, Adam, uh, we first met when, through a mutual friend, Koof Knotts. That's right. We'll uh, see down, you later today. Down, great, great. Down here in South Jersey, and then soon you brought uh, a first record to us. Um, what was it? Was the flow the, down. The, was the flow down, yeah, right? The world speak. Coming. World speak. Yeah, I'm so yep. drawing a blank on that. Right. And soon, a lot since. So I mean, right, <laughs> a lot. And things, and and as Terrence Martin says, things move fast at Rope Dope. So I, I tend to, I tend to, some of the past looks like a blur in the side view mirror. But right. one of the really important things um, Adam has done uh, is not only em- embrace being an independent musician. Uh, and, and bring more music to us and, and navigate the uh, interesting waters of the uh, 21st century in the music business, but also uh, he has started uh, a label That's right. with Rope It Up called Infinity Gritty. So people can look that up. Absolutely. But once again, welcome. Yeah, thanks it's for having me. Good to see you, man. Yeah, I yeah. love being here. We just had a 30-minute a, a conversation about yeah. the uh, perils of the music that business. That got us all warmed up, you know, so we, we, we can are just fired pick up. up from where we left off. Cool. So let, let let me uh, let's go back. Tell people, you know, uh, and and for my benefit as well. I don't know if we really covered this. Um, how, how did you, you know, when did you know that music was the thing, man? Yeah. So probably my earliest memory of music is going on one of those old school plastic horses out in front of the supermarket. No, it was we had one at home in New Jersey. Actually, I grew up. Uh, well, I was born in Allentown, but from age two to eight, I grew up in. Mom's Junction, New Jersey, oh, South well. Brunswick. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And we had one of those little plastic horses. My mom was spinning some kids' music, Sharon Moss and Bram. Oh, well. And I remember those up-tempo hits, and I just remember going back and forth on that horse and just feeling the groove. Wow. So I think that was my earliest memory of music, and when I felt like, hey, this is, this is something I enjoy. It wasn't like, hey, I'm going to grow up, and this is what I'm going to do for the rest of it, but it was, it was something I definitely It was a core sensitive. moment. Mm-hmm. Huh. To be, how old were you? Three like, or four. like three, three or four years old. Yeah. yeah. So to be that self-aware of like, wow, this is cool. Yeah. You know, I just feel just feeling the energy basically. Yeah. I, I didn't have like a whole lexicon and mm-hmm. the whole thing to describe life experience to, to describe it, but I knew I enjoyed yeah, what was happening was very much. Yeah. yeah. Nice, nice. And so, you know, from there you went off. Did did you went to music school or where, where did you study? Well, I studied a lot self-taught? privately growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, all keys. I, uh, starting with keys, and yeah. I actually tell this story a lot because I think it it really explains a lot of the role that parents and and uh, adult figures have uh, in the role of development of kids for music. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> because when I was six, my mom sent me to piano lessons, or actually, she had someone come to the house uh-huh. and play piano with us and teach me, but. I wanted to just run around. I did not want to play piano. My fingers were small. I was having a hard time playing this up, this old upright that was in the mm-hmm. corner of our house. Mm-hmm. It just wasn't really meshing for me. And at that age, if it's not working, you, you're trying to absorb. You go to the next thing. Right? Sure. Mm-hmm. So if my mom just thought, hey, well, he didn't like piano after a couple lessons. That's not the thing for him. Uh, that would have made perfect logical sense. Right. But three years later, we moved to Pennsylvania. <clears throat> I was nine, ten-ish. <clears throat> and... We, she gave me piano lessons a second time, and I vaguely remembered having these lessons earlier, and now it was a whole different experience. It seemed like my fingers were moving. It didn't seem so difficult. It seemed pretty fun, and I would have never known that. If she hadn't stayed on it. Yeah. She, she just felt, hey, you, you seem like you're into music or something. Why don't you take lessons? Nice. She just sent me. Nice. I had no say in the matter. Thanks, Mom. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so from there, I, I had different teachers growing up uh, uh, that were super influential and gotcha gotcha it's like you 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 watch a lot of great um, musicians and you have um, role models right but the ones that in your lives are really your teachers with music interesting yeah yeah I had the opposite experience but but this interview is not about me but music music was discouraged so um, but um, let's put it let's put a time context on this in history right? right so you're learning on uh you know a piano yes as a younger person yes but outside you know how dominant is the piano are we already well into 
uh, Moog and, and, and synthesized electronic music at that point in the, in the, in the popular culture? No. Uh, no. <clears throat> well, funny enough, the 70s and 80s was the burst of music synthesis, right? It was exciting, it was fresh. And then when I was, I was born in 83, so by the time I started learning, it was in the early to mid 90s again. Mm -hmm. And keyboards and piano sort of took a dip. Uh, it was a really, in music you had, well, you had hip hop and you had samples, but then you had a grunge coming out of Seattle. And the keyboard didn't really have <coughs> a prime focus in, in music. But up until, from, I would really say from did. the, yeah. Yeah, from the age of, say, 10 to 13, right before, was when I started playing piano again. And before I hit that sort of self identifying teenage state, I was just listening to whatever I thought was good. So my own exposure to music then was less socially influenced and more because of the fact I was learning piano, I would listen to classical music for fun. So to me, that was, that was cool. It had mm -hmm. nothing to do mm -hmm. with what anyone else was doing. So I was really into piano because it sounded good. I was enjoying playing it, and I would listen to Van Cliburn at night. Wow. Um, because I was being supportive with that. Hey, check this out, and the adults in my life. But gotcha. as soon as I turned 13, I wanted to get a guitar and play In Bloom by Nirvana. Right, yeah. right. So that's a different thing. I, you know, you weren't alone on that one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It, was, yeah. it felt, ah, oh, felt so good to just, just, just roll out those power chords. I asked the question because, um, you know, I think those early days of electronic music, aside from some very underground or very persistent people who were not getting a lot of visibility right. through the '80s and '90s, to me, it, in retrospect, it feels like this. You know, when a new technology comes online, everybody likes it for its, for the technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that the first 15 years of electronic music were probably um, out of context and it was just playing with the technology. So let's make this sound like the future. Right. Absolutely. Let's not have it integrate into anything. It's going to be over here. It's going to be like, this is what right. music's going to sound like later. I, I agree. And that didn't really, you know, it didn't, it didn't mesh into the popular culture so well. I think that's probably why it took a, a bit of a dip, you know, because it's like, that. I think we're there with the internet right now. So I think it's like, the future is going to be like this. And now we're like, I'm not really yeah, liking this, this so yeah. much, yeah. you know, yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. let me, let's, let's reorganize this and figure it out. I mean, it's not, it, does, it doesn't go away. And, and I asked the question and bring that up because by the time you're an adult, you're not just playing the piano, right? You're, you're, yeah, you're, you've got yeah. a keyboard. Yes. When, when did you, yes. when did that so start that to transition? Happen? So <clears throat> I think for me, the transition was going from, okay, piano, piano in the house, doing that sort of thing. I was studying with uh, Alex Gergar, who's an amazing Hammond jazz player who happened to live in my town. He's also Keith Jarrett's cousin. Wow. Uh, and he looks just like Keith Jarrett and he mentions it to you sometime down the line. Like, oh, oh, like by, not when you first. Oh, by the way, <laughs> and yeah. it's like okay, now I understand why you guys are all so good. Um, wow, wow. Yeah, so he he was playing Hammond, and that that was a totally new thing. Oh, uh, so here you go. So step by step. So you start right? seeing different things. Uh, he had a Korg M1 at the time. The keyboards that were coming out, the Korg Trinity Triton series was was sort of the leading mm -hmm. uh, workstations at the time. So I had gotten also he had a Korg N1, so I got a Korg N1. Mm -hmm. And then I upgraded later to a Korg Triton, which was the one after the Trinity, and it had a little uh, tube in there, which kind of gave it sort of an old school feel at the same time, which we all thought was cool. Kind of kitschy, but it was cool too. I do want to tell people on the show, and for those that are watching live, um, Korg is not a sponsor. No, Korg is not a sponsor. <laughs> But, but but we're but we're here. But it's part of history, and, and that's yeah, that's exactly how I was not a product these placement. Days too, because it's like this whole thing could be because of a company, and you just slip it in naturally. But we're just yeah. talking about real yeah. life, so yeah, that's yeah. just what happened. Um, we left off with uh, you getting into uh, you know electronic instrumentation, yes. right? And then what? Because um, I, I I don't think I've heard in, in all the projects that you have. If you, if you asked me, I would say keys. I wouldn't say piano. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, I have so, some piano that's, like, it'll be more of an homage, like Everfly Piano. It's a full piano track in the, right in the middle of the Ubiquity album. Okay. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, <clears throat> there's, all, there's always this side of trying to lend parts of yourself in a record and saying, okay, well, 
especially when you're establishing a few few records, you almost want to put out enough of your personality that you feel is a, is a spectrum yourself. That's why my first EP I called Balance, because I felt the whole time I really had to have one solo piano track, I had to have one kind of funky mm -hmm. like band track, mm -hmm. I had one thing that was completely improvised in the studio, multi-tracked, I had one thing that was sort of slow and chill, something that sort of covered all the genres, all the styles, half instrumental, half vocal, yeah, and something that just felt like, hey, this is... Uh, this right. is uh, what I can offer. These are the boundaries. Yeah, these the, are, this the, is sort the, of what I bring, bring for you. This of is what, sort of what Adam like Ahuja like can do. Tell you, you know, what I'd like to share. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a uh, piano player who put out several records with us, Richard X. Bennett. Mm -hmm. um, if you get the opportunity to connect with him in New York, please do. But um, definitely, Richard uh, said he always puts a, or he often puts a cover song, right, on his album. Yes. Because the cover song is something that people can recognize, mm -hmm. and then hear it in his style, yeah, and have it's like an entry point to understand what the music's going to be about. It's like you're 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 giving. And you've done. Have you done a Radiohead cover on one of these? Uh, I didn't do a Radiohead cover. So many Rupert of artists have. That's a, yeah. And and Radiohead sound is so they almost become their own genre. That when you describe it, like that, that's sort of Radiohead, and you kind of know. So right. what it is, they, right. they've just become so you know enigmatic in that sense. Um, I did a Christmas cover a couple years ago uh, of "Do You Hear What I Hear." About, it was five years ago, and put a YouTube video out. And I, I'm actually working on um, another cover song, which I think I'll record and release as a single mm -hmm. sometime next year. So that's kind of in my mind, but I'm not gonna yeah. mention what it is yet. No, okay. But I've been yeah. working on it. Yeah. Maybe maybe we'll put it in the credits when the, yeah, when, oh, yeah, when this yeah. thing when this thing airs. Definitely, definitely. There you go. Yeah. So then, so so, you mentioned you know a little bit of everything that you do. How would you define yeah. all the different things that you do, like projects, right? So we we mentioned the flow yeah. down. Mm -hmm. um, there's ubiquity. Is that the second here? Yes. Yeah. And then you've got all these other things happening on the label with E. Scott Lindner. Right. Uh, you mentioned Noon. Mm -hmm. Uh, who am I missing? There's yeah, a couple there's, of these Scott records, right? Yeah, there's tons of, there's a lot of different stuff. Um, I mean, part of the way this kind of happened was living in New York City and um, by default as a musician, working with other players and over the years getting involved with different projects and collaborating and doing all these different things and finding yourself part of a greater community and realizing, hey, um, wouldn't it be great if there was a way to really catalog this and <clears throat> start defining a brand around all this stuff I'm involved with. Document it. It, yeah. it makes sense. You know, otherwise it just felt so scattered. It's one day I'm not here and it's like, oh, it's, yeah, what did what did that guy do? I, I don't know. And it's not that it's about me, but the fact that I wanted to just do have a way to organize this stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And and then around the same time, uh, Scott and I had been working together um, on the engineer and creative side for quite some time uh, since I was in New York. And he's been working his way up and up and up into the studio world mm -hmm. and had just opened Pinch Recording Studio with some other co-owner friends of ours. And it was happening the same time I was thinking about the label and we were both thinking on the same mind and saying, hey, we can do a lot of projects that we want to lay down here. He also moves quick. Uh, yeah, I want to talk about that record yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. And saying, okay, great. This is a this is a way we can get projects going, get records out, mm -hmm. and and as it's gone on, Project K has uh, all these bands and all these projects and collectives I've been in for some while uh, found a way yeah. found found their way sort of underneath the umbrella. David Bayless, I've been playing with him. He was one of the first musicians I knew when I was in New York. Three, yeah. So everybody, everything just sort of <clears throat> happened, and I think that a lot of that also has to do with uh, the relationship with Rokudo. Uh, People recognize that they know what's going on. There's a greater community there, so all that magnetism combined allowed all these records to come out. That's great. Yeah, I, I really like it. You know, I, I probably never shared this story with you, but um, and I, I guess I'm going to say it on camera. Um, there we go. When I was deeply contemplating, you know, what's 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 a, what is a record label in 2010? You know, mm -hmm. like and why, why do we even exist? And I was thinking about independent musicians and what the challenges are. <clears throat> And how would would we fit in? And you know what's what's a vision for this? And it happened to be on in North Carolina, top the house was at the top of the mountain. It was like some six fifty five hundred feet up, you know. Yeah. And I'm standing out on the porch and I'm looking out over the mountains and the and I'm above a cloud. And so the cloud cover mm -hmm. 
is in the valley below me. Wow, that's fine. Right? And it looks just like the beach. It just looks like <laughs> just waves, like waves of water, right? Yeah, and, yeah, then, yeah. and I was like, not, and not that I previously had been thinking about the business. That morning, I'm just looking at that and going, yeah. you know, that just looks an awful lot like the ocean. And I was like, wait a minute. It, it kind of is the ocean, you know? And, and it's this glimpse of, of interconnectivity, right. the, the way nature works with interconnectivity kind of popped into my head. Uh, and I thought about all the diversity, like the, you know, it's all the same, but it's all so different. And I thought, right. this is a kind of exactly like music communities, like the Atlanta scene, the Philly scene, the New York, the Brooklyn thing, like your, your community, uh, and, and they're all interconnected. Well, they're all doing the same thing, but not necessarily connected. Right. So my vision as I walked down okay. was, let's just be a connector, right? And if you plant, and if you, and, 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 and if you tend to, you know, small scenes and small groups and small communities and tie them together, something should grow, Right. you know? And so it really, it pleases me to hear that we're tapped in Absolutely. to you doing that. Totally. And there are so many yeah. others. <clears throat> from Terrace Martin on the West Coast to the Atlanta thing to the UK. I mean, it's, it's happening everywhere. And, and, you know, taking that back to our conversation about what's going to happen in the music business and right. thinking big, maybe that is the future. Maybe there's uh, an interconnected network of artists uh, growing community right. worldwide that right. all ultimately... Maybe there's this flashpoint where it's just like, okay, now we're all right, we're all right. one yeah. large network of creators. Yeah, I almost think of it like there's two sides. You know, you have the the intangible, the relationship side, and then you have the tangible tool side. Mm -hmm. And either one of those can have enough mass and enough uh, energy to say, okay, boom, we're it's a force. Um, and we were talking about that earlier. We were talking about what are the next tools in the industry and how are things like AI influencing that and tech. Mm -hmm. And then we're also looking at the other side and saying, well, look, if that stuff disappears, you still need to have relationships. You still need to have – someone is still going to say, hey, I like this, and you're going to listen right. to that person. Or you're still going to say, hey, I'm coming to your city. Who do I know over there? Oh, this is part of my, my group over there. You know, that's, right. that's as old as humanity. So you have these two forces. You have relationships and you have tools. And I think when we're when we're building our music, when we're <clears throat> looking at ways to get it out there, um, we have to constantly think in these two sides. You know what? what yeah. to, and even when I look at something today, I was thinking, okay, uh, I'm I'm taking a lot of video of this tour, <clears throat> right? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> maybe I'll make one of those little Instagram uh, highlight portions of the stories where you say tour highlights. And then I start thinking about people that have been really creative about using those tools and each one of their little highlight sections has a cer certain kind of branding where they pick the story that appears and probably hacked into Instagram so it has a picture. I'm thinking, okay, what percent of people do that? Probably 5% of people. And then I think, say, what percent of people, or who's successful? How many people have done that? And I say, well, some people have, some people haven't. Well, maybe they had a certain branding talent and they went that way, but think of all the others that didn't. So basically, I start thinking about the tools and say, okay, there's so many tools out there. It's great to think about it, um, but you can choose which ones you want to use. You can act. And, and how much you use them. Exactly, exactly. Okay. I mean, we just use Facebook Live, but it's, that's the thing too. Not only with the fact that all the information is out there, but there's a plethora of tools themselves. So you only have time for so many. We could, we could choose Instagram Live or Facebook Live. With, right. with the tool we had right now, we couldn't even do both. Right. So. Huh. Everything does seem to be just so scattered. Um, and, but I think it's going to come into focus. I really do. I, I want to ask you what, and, and myself, which we don't do often enough, what does success look like in the music business? Like, what do you, what, do, what would you, how would you qualify success? Like, these are, we finally got it. These are good times for musicians. Right. If we're speaking on, uh, that's I would say that sounds like a macro question. I think it's the first thing that came that intuitively I thought about was a little bit of the micro level, which is something that what is an achievable piece of success that I can have as a musician that I can feel, right? right that can help bring the momentum to those bigger macro ones, right? So they one leads to the other. So it can be, things on the micro level are 
hey, I actually sat down and did something productive musically today. Maybe I, maybe I learned a new progression. Maybe I wrote a little piece of something. Maybe I maybe we worked on a production. And but that's already happening. Good. Right. Okay. Right. So there's, there's a little bit of that. But then there's things like I played a show and actually went out and talked to someone afterwards. And I found out what that music, what that service meant to them. Because that's a huge mm -hmm. thing. Sometimes you mm -hmm. don't get the feedback. So those are certain kind of successes in terms of seeing the impact and doing the work. I think on, on a, the macro level, um, it's certainly, as a musician, and so many musicians I know, it's that constant question of, uh, am I able to sustain myself doing this? And you know, what does that look like? I think having communities um, that are supporting in a, uh, a modern, like if you look, for example, at streaming, if you uh, look at the way that people do subscription type of things, if that kind of consistency and that kind of abundance is coming in um, that can support you to do that work, I mm -hmm. think, and you can, de and you therefore have the energy to dedicate more creative time towards it. That's when you feel, as a musician, that okay, I I can really focus on this the most that I can. So let me let me let me drill down a little bit more. Then, so is there anything wrong in the music business aside from revenue, um, or in 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 not that music business? The existing music business because my theory is that everything's wrong in in the major label entertainment system but just in your world in our world the independent music business is there anything wrong besides revenue uh, is everything else pretty cool it, all of the issues that I keep thinking about keep are definitely tied to revenue whether mm -hmm. it be how people are supporting music live or um, or merch or, or how they're supporting artists or what sort of portions of revenue are brought to musicians via the, the streaming platforms and how that's arranged or right. all these these definitely seem to be the big issues um i think being creatively challenged making cool music making great connections and sharing it seems to be alive and well as ever yeah in my opinion yeah. i don't have much, really deep qualms with that stuff i think people are influenced um uh, to make interesting stuff i think there's a lot of interesting stuff out there i know people oh, complain boy. about pop music and but every every generation complains about pop music as much as they complain about the generation before. So, you think? I think so. Um, uh, yeah, I, and I, I think we can go down a lot of rabbit holes with that. We I, sure I don't know could. Where we yeah. Go. Whoa, oh, 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 <laughs> comes to mind. Yeah. Uh, it's not a lyric yeah. I would have heard in the '70s. Although I did hear <laughs> some bad lyrics uh, back in the '70s. Um, yeah, we could, but I think we got to some, you know, some some yeah. interesting points here, and, and I would love for um, people to post in the comments, you know, uh, about this. You know, one of the things that we're trying to do at Twenty One Soul and at Rope It Up is 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 sort of deliver content that's entertaining to people, and and the only Absolutely. way that we can really do that is if people tell us what what you want, you know, mm -hmm. um, and hear it. I think it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, to sit down and talk with you because you're living a life uh, of creativity and risk yes, sir. in what you do that a lot of people don't don't yeah. have, you know, that I don't even have. I mean, I I take my share of risk, but I but I mostly at home. I'm not on the road all the time, and that, right, right. that's challenging in and of itself. Um, let's. I, we don't have a timer up, so I think we're probably pretty close. But I want to I want to point out that. Uh, Adam Ahuja is the founder of Infinity Gritty, uh, a record label or progressive uh, artist advocacy agency. So yeah, some other yeah. some other word. We need another word for record label. Uh, <laughs> based in New York City, and um, as well as a musician with uh, several projects of his own out. Um, and I encourage people to you know take take a listen to that. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks it's for having me. It's an honor us. to be working with you, Absolutely. and I want to encourage people to uh, check out uh, Infinity Gritty.